Okay, cool. So, um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jaydevan. I work for Freshworks. Uh, we've been running a series with E27 on, uh, it's sort of a startup playbook where we talked about marketing, sales, and a bunch of other topics, customer experience. Uh, the topic for today is uh, on sales. Uh, Johnny, we have a very experienced sales leader with us. Johnny's also been a founder. So he brings a unique perspective that is uh, good for startups and you know companies that want to scale and set up their sales engine. Uh, so Johnny also has a nice deck, which he's prepared for all of you. Uh, welcome, uh, some house rules I would like to talk about. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Cool, so uh, I mean, uh, this is, uh, you all know this, uh, you know, it's being recorded. If you want to if you want a copy of this, uh, let us know. We'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, next slide. If you have questions, you know, feel free to put that in the Q and A section, uh, you know, or the chat box. Uh, also, feel free to introduce yourself. You know, would love to connect with all of you after this on LinkedIn and you know Twitter, wherever you are. Uh, we have a program called Freshworks for Startups. Uh, if you uh, if you're new to this, uh, so Freshworks is a is a customer experience and employee engagement suite of products. What we do is we help you delight your customers. So, uh, you know, it's it's more like an operating system, which, you know, you can use to plug, uh, do all the plumbing behind the scenes so that you don't have to worry about a bunch of, you know, uh, things, including customer experience and, you know, how you interact with your employees. Uh, if you'd like to try our startup program, it's free for you. You know, uh, we have a partnership with E27. You can, uh, you'll get ten thousand dollars in free credits to try our products. There's a link right here. We'll also paste that in the chat. Okay, yeah, we have it in the chat uh, window. So go ahead and sign up there. You know, we'd love to walk you through. You know how it works and how your startup can really benefit from the program. Um. That's about Freshworks, guys. I would like to uh, invite Johnny for today's session. Uh, again, you know, very focused on sales and a bunch of things that will work for startups. So welcome, Johnny. Welcome to the, you know, uh, today's uh, show. Thank you. All right, let's get, get started. We go to the next slide. <clears throat> let's begin from there. But, you know, before we start here, I think, you know, um, I just want to quickly introduce myself. Um, I uh, started selling at the age of 15. Uh, that's immediately after my 10th. Uh, and what I was selling, I clearly remember back then were um, food processors, which were basically vegetable cutters. And I was selling these vegetable cutters across, you know, in, in the streets of Bangalore, you know, doing door-to-door -door sales. Uh, that's how my career in sales started at the age of 15. Um, and in, in about 10 years from then, I found myself selling uh, cloud computing services or cloud computing solutions in the Bay Area for Akamai Technologies. So that's my you know, journey of you know, how I began selling. Uh, <clears throat> and then you know, it's also pretty uh, nice to see the previous slide. If you could just go back to the previous slide for a minute. Um, it's, no, no, the previous slide, yes. Yeah, it's, it's nice to see the names like Axel Sequoia because uh, I've been a founder and, and, you know, once a founder, always a founder is what I truly believe in. So, you know, these are the investors that, that you know, I would have reached out to or have reached out to multiple times when I was running my own startup. And uh, it's, it's nice to see their name in here. And uh, it's nice to see that these are the guys who are backing us up uh, eventually, uh, especially the, the India growth story wise. Um, moving to the next slide, let me just, you know, land at a point where there's this beautiful book. Uh, I'm sure all of us have read this book and for the ones that haven't, then I think you should do it as of today. Um, where Peter Thiel is saying that it takes hard work to make sales look easy, which is bang on target. It's very simply said, but trust me, uh, anybody and everybody in this room who comes from the world of sales understands that it is those small little steps uh, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis that eventually lead to a sale. Um, and I really, I believe that um, every interaction that you're having with your customer, right from the day one to the point of getting, you know, the dotted line signs, 
every interaction is just an interaction for you to gain more confidence uh, and credibility from the customer, right? So whether it's an email or if, if you're pinging the customer or you know, you're, you're presenting to the customer, so on and so forth, because you're just building credibility. At the end of the day, people buy from people, right? And, and it is very important to come across in a very true, honest way that you really care for them and you're here to make sure that uh, you, know, you work with them versus otherwise, right? Being absolutely sales is not gonna help in that case. But he also says that if your product requires advertising or sales people, then you know, your product is not good enough. I don't know how much I would want to believe with it because if I do, then it just makes my role redundant. But yeah, that's another thing that you said, which is maybe a topic for some other day. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, let's just land at what are we talking about here, right? Like we have a product, you know, it's been conceived um, and it's, it's at a, a point where it can be sort of shipped out. Um, how do we do that? How do we build a, a smart GTM plan, which is also a start? So where do we focus, right? Uh, and, and I honestly believe that the focus should begin. And this is coming from previous experience and also having seen a bunch of startups where I've consulted and I'm seeing, you know, I've been following Freshworks' journey before joining Freshworks for about seven years now. So it is important to find your place in the larger scheme of things, right? I mean, as much as you would want to be in an industry where the tide is already high because in the tide is high in general, uh, you know, it picks up or rather lifts all the boats on it, which means that, you know, there is room for everybody. So being in the right market is the best part. Once you've been in the right market, finding your niche, finding your customer segment, finding the size of the customers that you have, uh, which will eventually translate for you to start getting customers on board it because at the end of the day, the first validity for any product company is the fact that you have customers, right? Now, but customers can come if and when you have really sharp selling skills as a founder or as you know the sales team. But the true validity, I believe, is in the fact that you've been able to renew that relationship, right? So you're also looking for a long-term uh, perspective here, which means that you've got to sometimes not even get into places where you will not be able to perform. Uh, you'd rather be picking up customers, which will be easier for you to work with, which will be a lot more forgiving. Uh, and, and like they truly say that, you know, you're only as smart as your customer. So bring in those customers who, you know, possibly make your life miserable at the beginning by asking multiple things for the least price. But at the end of the day, you know, that's your learning curve. That is where you're recording all those conversations. That's where you have your 300, 400 hours of recording and you sit back and listen to it because it's the customer who will finally eventually dictate what the product should be doing, right? As much as you, know, you would want the customer to use what you know, the customer has to use, at least in the business to business uh, market, I'm not pretty sure about VDC because you know, we had Steve Jobs telling us that if you ask the customer what they want, then you know, you're not doing it the right way. Um, so from that perspective, pick your size, pick your segment, pick your customer type, see where is it that you can really hit it hard and get going. And uh, uh, what, even when you're picking your segment, just make sure that for a product type that you're selling, you are talking to the right set of people because there's no point in talking to everybody and anybody. Um, and at the end of the day, even when you're marketing or if you're running campaigns, you'd rather be hitting the email boxes of people who would rather, you know, who really have those problems that you're able to solve. So from that perspective, I think for a startup, it becomes a lot more easier because Eventually, when you, when you choose your segment, let's say you choose your segment as SMB to begin with, to get that velocity, to get those many customers, to get that much data to further refine your product. Uh, eventually, when you're working with SMB, you more often than not end up talking to a C-level person or uh, a founder himself or herself, which then you know, makes it a lot more easier because your sales cycle becomes a lot lesser. If you've been able to really hit it on the head, then you know, your conversation become a lot more easier. You don't get into the rigmarole of you know, what happens in an enterprise, right from your legal to your, your purchase and all of that. So from that perspective, that's an easier place to go in if your product is right at the start. Um, and eventually when you're built and, and, and these very customers, smart customers have helped your product become smarter and robust, is when you could possibly look at going to mid-market 
and then eventually get into enterprise, which is what even if you look at, you know, Freshworks' journey carefully, then you would see that we built our muscle with the SMB, and then we are today, you know, trying to really build, you know, the muscles that we never knew we had through the mid-market segment. And then every now and then we are able to, you know, catch one of those or two of those or three of those large enterprise deals, which is giving us a sense that we are getting there. So from that journey perspective, I think a GTM plan should be designed accordingly. Um, just give me one minute, please. Okay. Uh, are we good till here? Am I audible? Is this fine? JK? Yeah, we can, we can hear you, Johnny. Yeah. Okay. Look, I, I really don't want this to be a monologue. So uh, if, if not like the entire group, but at least you and I can, you know, make it a little more conversational. Uh, I really don't want to be preachy. Uh, you know, I could be because of the uh, so-called knowledge that I carry, but it could also be a limitation uh, in this context. So I really want you to prod me, question me in between. Uh, but I'm assuming that the, the start was, you know, something that everybody understood. Yeah, I think this was good. Um, just, uh, you know, we can wait for a few minutes for the audience questions. But I, I've always wondered, you know, how companies, uh, especially in the SaaS and software tech space, start from the SMB segment and then go up into the enterprise. Have you seen any changes in the sales, uh, you know, sort of model of where, you know, uh, what's a typical sort of change that happens in a sales, uh, you know, in a company when, when you move, make that transition? Look, when you make that transition, uh, let's say from uh, uh, SMB to mid-market and then from mid-market to enterprise, uh, it's not like, you know, when you transit from SMB to mid-market, you're letting SMB go. You still carry SMB, right? And then when you're trans moving from mid-market to enterprise, you don't let mid-market and SMB go, right? You add on. But what it also in involves is to sort of get individuals who can play that game. Right, so if you can bring in the right team at the right juncture, like you can't get super senior folks while you're dealing with SMB because it's not going to make sense, right? And and you can't get you know a, a start startup folks to deal with enterprise because it's not going to make sense because these are two different paradigms. Now all they're talking similar languages, but at a different level altogether. So I think people and the kind of individuals you hire, the kind of individuals that you bring in, and how robust do you make your support system right from, let's say, billing to contract management uh, and all of that. If you're able to grow that as much as you're growing the business and as much as you're taking a leap of faith from SMB to enterprise, I think that's the key. Uh, but, you know, it's also, uh, it's all, it's like our growth journey, right? I mean, I mean, we, we go through that initial age where we assimilate everything and we learn very quickly. Then you get into this teenage area and then we, you know, get on to becoming 20 pluses. Uh, and in, in each stage of this, this time, we've used different faculties to deal with what's happening around us, right? Uh, the good part about being in the start stage is that you can make those mistakes. You know, you can, you can take excuse of your size to make those mistakes. And that's when I was saying that customers are a lot more forgivable uh, at the start stage. And, and you've got to use that to build that relationship and create a long-term journey learning from these customers because at the end of the day as much as you're growing your customers will also grow right and if you're maintaining that relationship then the very customer could become smb tomorrow and enterprise the day after right so from that context i think that's the journey uh moving further uh building an ideal customer profile which becomes really really important because you cannot go after everything and anything right your product might possibly be solving multiple problems but you need to find where your strength lies, right? And you also would have, as a founder, come up with this solution because you saw the problem. And you saw the problem because you were part of the problem at some point in time, right? And during that time, you know, the, the, the things that spoke to you in terms of why you wanted to solve those problems and the industry type and the market type and the customer size that spoke to you in terms of why you should be solving that problem is the very market industry and customer type you should go after from an ICP perspective. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, so, so whatever problems you're solving uh, stems from 
you know, the fact that you were part of that problem at some point in time, but you were the one who stood up and tried solving it versus cribbing about it. But then while you were solving for it, you would have had certain customer segments in mind. Um, and that's the customer segment that you have to go after, right? Um, focusing on companies with least time to close and, and lesser sales complexity, again, pings back to that SMB area where, you know, there will not be that much time. Like, for example, if you are sitting in front of a, a founder team or a core team of a startup, um, then you only have that window to land uh, an impression of the fact that your product can solve some of their problems. Not your features, but your product. And when you land that on that first, second, third meeting, it just becomes a lot more easier to have that open conversation with them. And they make sure that, you know, because the velocity that they're going at and the nimbleness that they own, uh, they, you sort of get, so uh, 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 that becomes favorable to you and you're able to close the deal much more faster. And they would obviously not have all the complexities that sometimes a mid-market or an enterprise uh, customer brings in, in terms of the legal aspect and so on and so forth. So from that perspective, I think, you know, just, becomes very critical for you to pick the right size to begin with. Uh, of course, you know, with all the other bells and whistles of, you know, ensuring that uh, you're joining this journey with the customer to build your product, you're joining this journey with the customer to grow with them uh, and eventually sort of tag along and, and be able to build a larger product and a robust product with, you know, thousands and thousands of SMB customers. Um, and then you have so much of data coming from various industries and various you know, sectors, that you're able to use that data to further refine your product, right? Um, so that being said, we can move to the next slide. Uh, Johnny, let me just quickly stop you there. I have a quick you know, <laughs> nuance to add there. So just, uh, you know, uh, the Freshworks example that you talked about earlier, which is, uh, you know, it, uh, there's a question in the Q&A box, which says, are these questions helpful for any kind of businesses? Uh, so a lot of things that, you know, we're talking about are sort of broadly applicable, but if you want to get specific, it's applicable to software product companies. And the Absolutely. beauty of that is, yeah. Uh, and the beauty of that is, you know, today you can be anywhere in the world, but can be selling, you know, to any other anywhere in the world, right? Like, so Freshworks started as a tiny company in Chennai. Our first customer was in Australia. We have, we hadn't even met those customers for like a while. Now, the way to imagine that is to imagine that as a sort of, you know, a two by two kind of a matrix, right? Like where you have, you know, a product which is easy to, you know, it's not very complex. It solves a particular pain point or a need and it's quick and easy to solve for, right? That can be closed online. So that's called the inside sales kind of model, right? So when you look at the two by two matrix on the left side, you have least complexity, you know, easy to close and those kind of things there you probably want to have like an inside sales kind of led model. And obviously Johnny will talk more about that, but you know, uh, and then towards the right, as your complexity grows up, you want an assisted sales model where, you know, you have your sales folks helping your customers, you know, really understand the problem, what's the solution and then sort of recommend solutions, right? Like, so anyway, I'm not the expert here, but don't want to go too, too much into that, but you know, I just wanted to add that nuance here because there was a question in the Q and A box. Uh, I hope that answers it. Uh, we can move on to the next slide now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that made sense. Okay. Uh, let's let's look at you know building a team, right? So so going back to if you can just for a second go back to the previous slide, um, we spoke about getting the customer right, which is you know one of the most important things. Um, and meanwhile, you've got to build a team. So going to the next slide again. Uh, what what does it take to build a sales team, and you know at what point should you be bring should you be bringing who right? Uh, and it, it just becomes very very important because you know you really don't want to start off with you know a, a sales VP or a or a senior sales manager and and you know the roles like that at least not at a level where there are you know five sales reps and you're just trying to test waters. Um, ideally, it's always good for the founder or the CEO to be involved in every deal because you know it's your baby, uh, and there is going to be nobody else who can sell it better than you. 
Um, and you're also, you know, getting that direct immediate feedback from customers, which keeps you very real. Uh, it, at times could possibly, you know, even hurt your founder's ego, uh, uh, which, you know, when uh, an investor hurts, it's a different story, but when a customer hurts, you know, you gotta really listen. So from that perspective, it's important that, you know, you, you get involved in that initial stage, you go with the team, you know, you show the team how to do it. Um, uh, and then, you know, try and identify what's working and try and replicate it, um, um, you know, even from an onboarding perspective. And, and during this time, you know, ideally not really worry about sales efficiency, sales productivity, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to discover um, and you got to be easy on yourself during this phase. Now, how long is this phase going to last? I think only revenues would possibly decide that because when you realize that at one point you're not able to make it with these five guys and you know, you'll obviously go out there and hire more. And going to the second stage, when you look at, you know, let's say 50 to 20 reps, right? Um, you would have had brilliant samples of, you know, calls where it really went good. And then there were calls that you can learn from. Um, so that becomes one of the things that sort of can act as an, an enabling model. Uh, create a graduation criteria, you know, make sure that people who are getting onboarded, they are really well versed with the product, with the, the industry knowledge and, and with the customer details and everything. And do that very consistently so that, you know, you're building, what you're building right now is a core sales team, the start sales team and, and your success, you know, Pretty much like people say, right? It's it's the business idea is great, which is awesome. But if the, the, the team is not great, then you know the business idea is no good. So from that perspective, it is really important to get in the right set of people and make sure that you really really invest time on them. Um, have those daily meetings, weekly meetings, and 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 pay those recorded calls, good or bad, really doesn't matter. You can always add fun to it. Uh, it even make it look interesting. It doesn't have to be really pulling somebody down or raising somebody up the end of the day um, and leverage product marketing team as much as possible and uh, celebrate the graduates. So when you put them through a rigor, put them through a, through a test and they come out clean, they come out scoring well, then you really have to celebrate that because that's exactly what they're going to, that, that chip on the shoulder is what they carry to a customer conversation. And it's very important to sort of insert that chip. Um, and you cannot be treating that team as the usual run-on-the-mill sales team. It doesn't work like that. You know, it's it's almost like expecting a five-year young baby to sort of walk, talk, and run like a, a fifteen-year-old. Uh, it's not going to help. So, so you got to make sure that you know you 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 deal with them accordingly. And once you are above, you know, when the revenue decides it, when 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 you're pressed for time, and you see that everybody's really pulled apart is when you bring in you know, more people, but once you bring in more people, then you'll have to identify an enablement resource. And more often than not, you would find that the enablement resource will be coming from that core team that you had started, uh, where now there is almost like a founder-like attitude and a founder-like ownership of this whole thing. And that person or that individual becomes the enablement resource. Um, and then begin measuring and iterating onboarding format. You know, see what works for you, what is not working. Consider investing in technology, like case in point. Uh, you know, we we have a bunch of products that really help us with enablement, especially given today's day and age where everybody is pretty much sitting at their home and no one can come into a, a, a conference room to get trained. I think uh, we'd be really, really getting help with some of the tools that we use internally. There are a bunch of them out there. Wouldn't want to name the one that we keep using at this point, but honestly. Uh, using a tool really helps because that's you know part of when you begin, begin scaling and then run competitions because now you have a larger team so you'll have to run competitions if, if you know someone is really really doing well at that one sector add another person you know create that competitive spirit because you know ideally that what that's exactly what keeps everybody going right when you look at the scoreboard and you see that you know you're on third you would want to be on second or you're on second you want to be on first and when you're on first really want to consistently be on first. So, you know, when you get in and get out of review and you know that you've really done well versus there is a long way to go, that is the barometer uh, that you're getting on a daily basis or a weekly basis to see, uh, you know, whether or not you're really doing good. So from that perspective, you know, like you were rewarding and awarding the stage of 15 to 20 reps, you get on to running competitions and then of course rewarding and awarding that. 
Um, so this is my viewpoint of how it could be done at the start stage. And if there are questions, I'm ready to answer. So, John, it's just one quick question. Uh, you know, when, uh, you know, I've heard this uh, a lot of founders and even like, you know, uh, companies say this is, you want to start scaling your sales engine when you have a repeatable sales model, right? Like, you know, and uh, can you tell us what a repeatable sales model looks like typically? Uh, I'm assuming this is, this comes right after the sort of, you know, uh, product market fit and you have some kind of, you know, uh, growth coming in, right? Yeah, yeah. So a repeatable sales model, if you ask me, I mean, uh, or, or at least when you know that you, you, your customers are repeating um, on two fronts, right? One, your customer type is repeating, right? So if you're closing more, uh, let's say, for someone like Capillary, when they began, uh, they were closing more. Uh, I mean, retail was, was where they were really, really killing it. And then they repeated that, not just in India, they went, they repeated it in Southeast Asia, in China, so on and so forth, right? So if you're seeing similar sized and similar industry customer coming in, that's one repeat and confidence that you get, which means that you know now the only way to sort of penetrate further is by adding more people, right? That's one part. And the second part is the second layer of selling, which is selling again comes in, uh, because honestly speaking in the product world, selling just doesn't stop at getting the contract in and getting paid. That's when the whole work starts, right? Now you have to implement. Now you have to you know, make sure that the customer is adopting. Now you have to make sure that the values that you promised during selling is being met on a consistent basis. Because if all of that doesn't happen, JK, then we're not going to get a repeat business from this customer at the end of the day, right? And okay. like I was saying initially, the validation not just comes from being able to sell once, uh, the validation comes from being able to sell multiple times to similar customers and also being able to sell multiple times to the same customer. You get what I'm saying? So when, when, you see, when you see that kind of traction is when you decide that you want more people on board. All right. And uh, a related question from uh, Gerald Lowe in the audience. The question is, how do you identify sales talent for hiring? Especially, <laughs> good question. Especially at the start stage. The, the reason why I'm laughing is, you know, when when when, in, when I founded a company and the initial hires that I did, you know, I was coming from Akamai. You know, I was coming from a, a large place, uh, you know, with large payouts, <clears throat> and I felt that 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 was the way to go. So I picked up some really big, uh, uh, you know, folks with hefty pay packages, and you know, faced the brunt of it. Uh, I think ideally what you would need is someone who can hit the ground running. If you ask me, wisdom tells me that you got to look only for three things. And I do that even when I interview somebody, you got to look for attitude, you got to look for appetite, and you've got to look for aptitude, right? And it has to be a three on three, right? Pedigree doesn't matter. Which company they're coming from doesn't matter, right? Experience honestly doesn't matter. At the start stage, these are the top three things that you've got to look at, and it has to be three on three. Anything less than three on three is not the right place to you know, be in. Um, and you generally get that appetite, attitude, uh, and sometimes even attitude coming at the start stage of everybody's career, because over a period of time, we just sort of phase out we become comfortable with who we are and things like that. And there's nothing to prove at times. But I think these are the three things that you look for. I honestly wouldn't ever look for pedigree. I honestly wouldn't ever look for, I'm talking about someone who's too, supposed to be street smart, get on street, you know, catch a customer off guard and, and sell and come back. So from that context, these are the three things. I hope I articulated it right uh, from a perspective of what are the three things that I look for. Uh, but you also need to look for someone who's consistently, especially let's say during an interview, when you're talking about their previous role and, and if they're talking about the deals that they brought in and so on and so forth, be very uh, mindful of the numbers that they are throwing. Uh, ask for their quota, ask for the deals that they're talking about. Literally make it look like one of those uh, you know, quarterly reviews. Uh, because if they're faffing, then you will realize that the numbers are going all over the place. And at the same time, if you find, I truly believe, and this could be my bias, that if someone is constantly saying, we did this and we did that, then maybe that's not a good sign. Uh, 
you you generally find a sales guy saying i did this you know there is that ownership to say <laughs> yeah so when you hear a lot of i uh, uh, you know is when you know that you're talking a to the right person and then after that what that i did needs to be literally numerically validated before you bring that person in that, yeah, so you want to make sure that yeah i think that's a very good insight you want to make sure that uh, the person is not taking credit for the entire team's work but you know something which is uh, more ownership led in that sense yeah yeah so so that's i hope that answers the question but in a, in a nutshell you know this is how it works and look i mean i i personally believe that whether a person will really do good or not only time will tell right uh the the thing that you got to really be absolutely clear about with this person because you know honestly this person could have gone and joined any mid market or an enterprise company there is no dearth of jobs but you know this person wants to work with you and that's the reason why this person has even come to you it is important that you drive home a simple factor which is to say that hey look i mean whether or not you will be kicking ass here only time will tell but uh, i want you to make this choice because you know this is the company you really want to work with right we get, it's, it's a choice that you're making right and and <clears throat> we're not making a choice we're just onboarding you right and mm-hmm. like for example you know i've joined uh, freshworks about 10 months ago um now i would have said a thousand things in during my seven interviews that i had right <laughs> and i would have prepared for it and all that jazz now time will tell whether or not i'm able to deliver on things that i've said right but if after having joined i if i had not seen what i saw from the outside and if i was not as thrilled and excited as i was from the outside then there are chances that i might shut down as an individual and i might might not be able to perform to the fullest of my potential because there is no platform to do so right if i'm not being heard because you would always want a pre and post of a person joining right so there has to be a a pre johnny stephen and a post johnny stephen effect uh, in whichever team that i join in the same way you you got to ensure that this person who's joining feels that responsibility of having a pre and post impact on the team right and if you see them taking up to that if you see them getting excited about that aspect i think you got the right person besides all the other checks and balances that we've done all right that's perfect i think we can move on to the next slide yeah sure someone is checking time as well right i just don't want to drag this too long um <laughs> so Yeah, talking time. about a repeatable model right constructing a repeatable model right so building a repeatable and predictable sales model you know that's one of the most paramount things because you know that's where the growth comes from growth comes from recurring revenue growth comes from retaining customers because you can't be bleeding while growing because that's not going to help so at the end of the day uh how do you with as a sales organization which is like really really responsible we are all living this binary life uh, <laughs> so uh you know i i cannot have an excuse at the end of the month or end of the quarter or end of the year i can only have my results um and nothing else really matters so i mean uh, i hope i'm not harsh while i'm saying this but you cannot uh you cannot uh pretend to have a career in sales you either have it or you don't have it um so from that perspective um uh, the thing here is you know how do you repeat how do you maximize what's working for you and and how do you make it a lot more predictable um from that standpoint um you know obviously it also for for a founder you know he needs to manage or she needs to manage the headcount they need to manage you know profitability that needs to be certain incoming and outgoing uh, uh you know sort of viewpoint and based on which you will be growing or not growing So from that perspective it's very important to know that you're able to sell repetitively to similar sized and similar kind of customers and you're also able to renew the business with the same set of customers um so from that perspective mapping out your sales process becomes extremely extremely important um and that's when you're literally you know maybe uh the getting into teenage uh, growing that 
those awkward mushes and, and uh, a bad voice, if you look at it that way. But it's also important to you know, still look elegant and still look like somebody who has it all in control. So from that perspective, I would say that you, know, you look at each of the deals, you scrutinize them, uh, you see how many steps it took for each deal to close at each, each, each you know, deal size. Uh, you will come to a sweet spot where you know that, okay, a uh, 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 XK MRR deal for me takes about three months and a Y takes about 10 months. Um, so, you know, therefore, I now know that if a sales rep is saying that this is a 3K MRR deal, then I know that, you know, we're going to get it in the next three months if everything goes right. But at the same time, somebody's saying I'm getting a 10K MRR deal, I know that it's going to take seven months. So I'm able to predict my revenue, plan my revenue accordingly. And I'm also able to say that, hey, you know, we seem to be closing a lot of deals at this size. So every time we have an opportunity, which is of that size, and we put a lot of focus on that at an immediate level, while we have a larger opportunity, which can be dealt with ease. But, you know, when you're looking month to month, quarter to quarter, which is where repeatability comes from in terms of human habit. Um, so from that perspective, you need to know where your sweet spot is and where you're repeating more and where most of the traction is coming from. So that even the team is working towards creating that second nature, which will happen only when they're doing it day in and day out. It's not like one of those enterprise, enterprise sales guy who possibly closes two deals in a year and makes his quota. Uh, we're talking about someone who has to close 30 to 40 deals literally every quarter to make their quota. Right? So from that perspective, I think it just really becomes important also to then create opportunities market at the right segment and ensure that the pipe is also built accordingly in terms of what's working for you the most. So from that angle, consistently CR remained, if that's even a word, is really important because you've got to record, review, and archive all these conversations um, you know, and, and deal, deal motions so that at the end of the day, you're able to get a viewpoint, uh, a, a data structure, which lets you know what's working for you and what's not working for you and able to make those choices based on what this data set tells you. And a CRM becomes very important uh, in that journey. It's an enterprise sales motion obviously will be different from an SMB mid-market deal sales motion. So you'll figure that out and, and, and you see that your larger deals take time, smaller deals you know, come in a little easy, but smaller deals with a mid-market or large enterprise could also take time because it's not about the size of the deal, it's about their buying process and you can't do anything about it, you have to wait it out. So those are the checks and balances, but at the end of the day, you need data uh, and that data will come only when you know, you're one year into it and you've had enough traction and you've consistently recorded, reviewed and archived these conversations so that you're able to then crunch data and figure out what's working for you, what's not. Uh, and someone from the revenue ops team, by then you should have one who will let you know of what's working for you and where you should be giving more of your focus versus you know, which are the ones that are not working. So possibly, you know, water under the bridge or maybe for a later day in time. I want to just uh, one quick question. Speaking of predictability, which you talked about, you know, uh, and how to manage headcounts and all of that. Um, are there any benchmarks that you feel are like, you know, sort of uh, industry-wide or even like sort of, you know, even if they're a little, little vague, it's fine. Like, you know, as to how much time does it take to close a typical, you know, a small, uh, uh, according to the deal size, like, you know, it could be, you know, enterprise or mid market or SMB and, you know, any, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Uh, so usually what happens is, uh, again, like I said, right, it's not just about the deal value. It is also about the size of the customer, right? So let's take it in two parts. So if we purely go by the rule of thumb in terms of the size of the deal, then, you know, you, you, you'd find that a larger deal, uh, because there is so much more depending on it, uh, gets a lot more scrutinized at multiple levels at the customer side versus a smaller deal. Because at the end of the day, how much of their budget are you taking away from them? Right? If you're taking a massive budget away from them, then they'll have those many questions and, and those many scrutinies to do before they sign up with you versus if you're taking a smaller pie away from them. Right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's that give and take. Um, and, and, and that's why I think pricing and going after the right deal size also becomes really important because we're really focusing a lot of time on larger deals. And as a start company, uh, then maybe you're just not setting yourself up for initial success. And when you don't get that initial success, then the morale goes down. 
right? Like forget about even a startup, right? Even at, at, at Freshworks, like, you know, uh, a mid-market sales rep, uh, yes, you have a quota and, and the quota is aggressive, all that is fine. But if you're just going after the large deals and hoping that they will close for you, you will invariably find yourself demotivated because, you know, you wake up every day to find out that when someone else closed some other deal, someone else has closed some other deal. But if you are consistently closing the smaller deals because you've built a pipe around it, what it also does is that it keeps you running. It, it keeps you, you know, uh, it, it, it's the example that I give my team. Like, uh, if you go to a restaurant that is full most of the time, right? Versus you go to even an elite restaurant that is not full most of the time, you will see the, the, the lack of activity, even at an individual level, at a restaurant, which could be elite, but is not having enough traction because they, 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 they're not practicing, right? It, they're not talking to so many customers. It's a similar thing here, right? You know, you've got to make sure that you have enough because at the end of the day, it's your preparation that meets that opportunity, right? And you can't be preparing only in a simulated environment. You have got to go out there and talk to customers, which means that, you know, you have to close those smaller deals and create that muscle to close the larger deal. So from that perspective, I think you should give enough time to each deal size. Uh, but at the same time, you should also know that, hey, if I'm closing, a, if I'm chasing a larger deal with a larger company versus a, you know, a, a larger deal with a smaller company, I have a better chance of closing a larger deal with a smaller company way earlier than the other one. So you got to pipe it accordingly. You got to make sure that, you know, of course you're going after all of them, but there's only 24 hours in the day and only, you know, so many days in a year. You have to plan it accordingly and make sure that you're going after places where you see enough responses immediately, but at the same time, you're nurturing the conversations that you know will close, but not exactly in two to three months time. So there is no rule of thumb. Uh, I think you've got to be cognitive of the size of the deal and the size of the company. It could be a small deal, large company, it's still going to take time. Or it could be a large deal, small company, it will take lesser time. But, but these are choices that you have to make on the run. But you know, again, when you crunch larger data, you get to know the real story and you can plan accordingly. But at the initial stage, I think these are two things to be very cognitive of. Got it, got it. And a couple of questions coming in from the audience. One is, uh, would you recommend sales reps having niche expertise when your product offering evolves? Uh, I think uh, the question is more on the lines of, should you start off hiring generalists and then go on to like have like really focused sales folks? Uh, you should always hire sales folks at the start level who have context. So you should always do contextual hiring. Context of the customer, context of the product, what is that product solving, and context of the region, which is one of the most important things. So if you have regional context and customer size context and product context, I think that's the only way to start. You cannot hire somebody at a gut level and expect that person to perform. So like I was saying at the initial part of this, this conversation, you know, you, you, you got to hire people who can hit the ground running at multiple levels. Now, how do you put that chip on their shoulder is where you're building the process, right? But otherwise you've got to have people who can come and have an impact from day one internally and externally thereafter. So contextual hiring is what I would suggest. Anything out of context at the start stage is not a good place to be. All right. There's a question about CRM, you know, what CRM uh, to use. And uh, the simple answer is go and check out the Freshworks CRM. I'm sorry, I couldn't help <laughs> let that go. But uh, it's, it, you know, definitely check it out. You know, thanks for asking that question. You know, uh, The other question here is, you know, as a solo entrepreneur, are there milestones I should watch out for that can help tell whether I need to start hiring sales talent? I think this is a good one, yeah. Uh, you'll have to repeat that. I, I, I sort of got the question, but I want to make sure I got it really right. What is that question? Sure. So the question is, uh, if I'm a solo entrepreneur, are there signals that I should look out for uh, when uh, uh, to know when I should hire sales folks? Like, I'm assuming like the solo entrepreneur is doing all the sales by themselves. And you know, at some point you want to hand it off to sales folks. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> when you will start saying no to customers is when you need to figure out to hire somebody else, right? So till that point where you are able to meet customers and have those conversations, um, I think it's all good. Uh, but the day you realize that you know you you will need uh, an added uh, assistance purely because you cannot be in two places at the same time, uh, I think that's the day when you start you know adding people. And I'm sure you'll get a sense of it you know way before the time arrives. Uh, but yeah, I mean if you can't be in two places at the same time, then you know that's that. There you go. And, and if it happens consistently. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, at a point where you have something repeatable, you want to sort of hive it off. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Which is uh, which brings us to the next slide, which uh, John is going to talk about, which is how do you actually make that repeatable model, right? Like, so uh, take it away. Yeah, yeah. So you you obviously need to you know have a, a qualifying process. Now the process could sort of depend on what kind of customer type and all of that, but you know I've always found that metric is the best way to go. Because you have your metrics, which is all about, you know, convincing your customers. You're going with those numbers. Like you're asking those pertinent questions, like if we improve this by one percent, how much will it save your business, or how much more revenue will you generate? Right. So the metric becomes really important there. Um, and then you need to find out if this customer can spend money at this point in time or not. Uh, do they have the money to spend? And is this a problem large enough? For them to spend that money right now to solve, that's another question. That becomes the E of metric. And then you're talking about decision criteria. Uh, you know, pretty much literally asking your customer, like if you had a if you had a magic wand, what would you want to solve? What are the top three things that you would want to solve with you know whatever you're facing right now? And then find our space in it. And if we have a space in it, yes. If we don't, then obviously that is a place where you're not scoring. Uh, and then talking about decision-making process, draw an entire roadmap. So case in point, if a customer says, hey, yeah, this looks good, and I want to deploy it in, let's say, the month of October, and you're talking to the customer somewhere in the month of Feb or March, then you've got to be able to draw a map of sorts from now till October in terms of all the activities that you would do to get there, right? And where will the customer be involved at what point in time of the activities, right? So it could be right from your demo, it could be from you know multiple uh, trials and, and the results of those trials and, and doing an A-B testing, whatever that is, right? So if you're able to very categorically call out the fact that October is when this customer is wanting to deploy this, which means that I have X number of months to work with this customer and drive that credibility, which also means that you have time here. So you've got to create that cadence or set of things that you're doing from now till October and keep consistently checking if the customer is also traveling alongside in that journey, right? Which gives you the confidence, the fact that the customer is in it with you. But the moment you start seeing the customer wandering away from that journey, in you know, uh, then you know something is wrong. Either the circumstances have changed, or maybe a competitor is talking. And when you talk to your customers repeatedly. And you will get to know that the customer is talking to a competitor because of the kind of words that they'll start using. Like each company has its own language. Uh, so in, in my case, like I know when the customer is talking to Salesforce based on a couple of things that they're saying to me on the call, especially they may not be saying that they're talking to Salesforce, but when they start you know, calling something a particular thing, I know that they're talking to Salesforce because I know sort of the, the the language that Salesforce uses while they're talking to customers. And so it becomes really important to traverse through that journey with the customer. Uh, understand that there is going to be some legal process, that going, there will be some infosec questioning, uh, and all of that needs to be called out within that journey. And you've got to make sure that you are preempting that in order to ensure that you've dealt with it a month or two before when you were expecting the deal to come in. Because if you haven't done that, then you get into the, the, the rabbit hole of legality and then you, you never come back from there. And you look like this person who knows that this business should be closing at this month, but you're not able to do that because it's out of your hand and it's out of the customer's hand because it's a legal thing that is coming and they will not allow something, you know, unless they are totally sure about it. And that could take time. So you have to sort of envision all of that and make sure it becomes part of the decision process or the journey, the paper process that you've built up. Uh, but ideally, uh, I would say, you know, 
when when you when you, when you've done this repetitively, when you've done this across hundred customers, you've done this across two hundred customers, and you've also done it across repeat business, then you will know you know at each stage how much time it's taking for what size customers. You'll also be able to then review your own sales reps when they're coming to you and saying that you know I'm going to bring this deal in four months' time. Then you can put them through this process and see where this deal is actually lying and whether or not it will close during that particular time, because then you can just really call the bluff. Uh, and I'm not saying the sales rep is bluffing. I mean, as a salesperson, I'm also like that. You know, we all have green sunglasses and everything looks green for us. So even the customers nodding, you know, we know that, you know, this is what, like, we, we're just hopeful guys, right? Because we're trying to create things out of thin air. But that being said, somebody has to give reality check and there needs to be a process in place and there needs to be, uh, you know, uh, a metric way of looking at it. Um, what it does is, you know, while you're doing this, all of this at an early stage of your business is that it helps you create a, a sales playbook as you grow. Uh, it helps you be able to copy paste what's working in a particular region to another region because, you know, you really tried and tested this playbook in one region and it's just about taking it and copy pasting it in another region. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with that, I think I come to a conclusion. Uh, if there are questions around metric, if there are questions around qualifying uh, process, I'm more than happy to talk about it. If there are questions around, you know, what does this playbook look like, uh, then I'm more than happy talking about it. So there's a question from the audience, which is you talked about, you know, infosec questioning. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, I guess this is as you move up into the enterprise you will have more infosec people involved in deals and they will have you know compliance questions and things like that right like is that what you mean yeah that's what i mean so we will get into compliance questioning uh, where you know it could come down to data security it come down to where are you hosting our data it could come down to what are the uh, uh, which which lands rule are you abiding by you know is that aligning to the the rules that we abide by right and things like that uh, which is another layer of legal, but at the end of the day, you know, these are not, literally these are out of your control, right? You cannot do anything. And therefore I'm saying that you need to sort of make sure that when you create a path of this entire process of MedPIC, you, you're literally building a roadmap of a three month or a six month or a 10 month. And you know that these are the activities that are supposed to happen during this, this entire journey. And you also know that, you know, if I'm not going at the same pace, uh, you know, then obviously I'm delaying the fact that I'm, you know, reaching that eventual goal of closing the deal by 10 months or six months or whatever I've decided to begin with. Um, so if you just put a stencil or maybe a blueprint, if you can look at it that way and ensure that you're able to take the customer from point A to point B to point C to point D, eventually to Z, which is closing the deal, uh, it becomes a lot more easier. Um, because at least, you know, over a period of time, data will tell you that most of your time goes in you know, demoing or most of the time goes in, you know, proving the concept uh, or most of the time goes in the legal aspect of it and things like that. And then you're able to therefore uh, better manage your revenues. You're able to better forecast your revenues because now you know that there are, you know, 300 deals that you're working on and each one of them is at this XYZ stage and these are the sizes of those deals. So I'm expecting based on the previous data that, you know, this is when the, the revenue chunk will come uh, from, these deals and you're able to then see how much are the sales for uh, sales reps forecasting and then you will go and do reality check and get the real numbers from them because it's really important to have that because if you don't have that barometer then you purely go by what the sales rep is saying and you really not know whether or not it is going to happen and you'll only find out after it does not happen and which is not a great place to be in. Um, so as much as I'm saying this as if we are already on the 10th month or the second year uh, but ideally, the seed needs to be, you know, placed right on day one, which means that you have to get started with these processes right on day one, including for yourself. Uh, yeah. And then as and when people come in for them as well. Uh, and it's good to start from day one because then you're able to cascade that information in the right confident way uh, versus expecting a senior sales manager to come in and set up your process, which I really, I think it's very cost prohibitive because guys like me don't come at a, a, a less cost uh, and you don't 
or shouldn't be affording it at the beginning. Just to circle back to that infosec question, I think with uh, you know things like GDPR and HIPAA compliance and all of that, you know, it has become an important question for most buyers. So a lot of startups have that in their roadmap somewhere down the line. But you know, initially when you're very early in your product journey, you know, you may not uh, have started building uh, things around those. Uh, you know, so uh, the more, when you start say having to say no to a lot of customers with respect to compliance or you know. Uh, uh, as you grow into your enterprise, as you go in, uh, deeper into enterprises, that's when you probably want to focus a little harder on, you know, taking this feedback back to your products teams and telling them, hey, you want to sort of, you know, start working on these aspects of, you know, um, compliance, right? Like so. Yeah, and adding uh, to that, JK, adding to that, it also helps us pick up those certificates uh, that we will need as a company to grow further, right? Because if you are saying no to multiple customers. On a monthly basis, because you don't have a particular certificate, then you want to go and invest in it and make sure that you go through that with role of getting that certificate. Yeah, so we had a great example actually. Uh, one of our customers came in through the startup program. They asked us, you know, can we? Uh, do you have HIPAA compliance? And HIPAA is, uh, you know, in for healthcare, you know, in in the US. And uh, so at that point, we were only building it out. But the moment we finished it, you know, the customer started using that solution. They converted, they went on to raise like a large series A kind of round. And, you know, it was a pretty interesting example of how you could, you know, just that compliance certificate swung the deal really, you know, so. Anyway, so uh, if we don't have other questions, we are right on time. Uh, I think we can, uh, yeah. Anybody in the audience have any questions? Okay, so I don't think we have any more questions. So we can end the session here. I hope this was useful. Thanks for attending everybody. Um, I think we had about 60, 70 attendees and you know we had good retention throughout the session. So that was good. Uh, thank you so much, Johnny, for spending uh, time with uh, the audience. I think it was very useful, practical insights and lessons. Uh, loved you know, all of the example, you know, all of the insights that you brought to the table. And uh, thanks for to the E27 team for putting this together. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice week. Bye.